Hey, Mac. There's supposed to be some fishing boats down here. Yeah, straight down the line, three or four blocks. Stop when you reach blue water. Can't miss them. Thanks. Good luck. I remember that first day I landed in Tarpon Springs. Nice, quiet little town. And as clean as a new dime. I thought, this is for me. No excitement, no trouble. Uh, I wasn't looking for trouble. I'd had enough of that in the Navy. I was looking for a job. When my trick in the Navy was finished, I got to talking around. Somebody mentioned a place in Florida. Tarpon Springs. I never heard of it. Big sponge fishing place. Biggest in the world. Lots of work for divers. I still never heard of it. Ah, what a beautiful place. Blue water and a sky that still belonged to God, not to a bunch of smokestacks. Yeah, but you can drown just as dead in blue water as you can in any other kind. Maybe if I'd remember that, I would have drifted on. Maybe. Sponges grow at the bottom of the Gulf of Mexico. That's right, sponges. The business you used in the bathtub for to wash the car. The stuff you bought in the dime stores, only not for a dime. Let me show you what I mean. Take uh, Captain Briarcus's boat to St. Philip out in the Gulf on a sponge trip just about the time I arrived. Sponges start out by being alive like a kind of bushy plant growing in 12, 14, 16 fathoms of water, 80, 90, 100 feet down. That's why the sponge pickers had to be divers. This one was Alex. I got to know him well. Signaling for another empty sack. How long has Alex been under? Two and a half hours. Pull him up and shove off before something happens. It's plenty safe. Send him down another sack. I want more sponges. Okay. The diver's job was to keep filling the net sacks with sponges and getting them hauled up on deck. Or, if you were a guy like Captain Briacus, you had it easier. You could take time off when you wanted to feed the porpoises. The gulf was full of them. And there was always enough fish on board to make them jump for their dinner. I got to know Briacus too. A hard, shrewd little character. Hated by his crews, but the best sponge boat skipper in the Gulf. This was just the topside, under the sun. Underwater, there were other kinds of livestock that didn't do any jumping. They went for another kind of bait. Giant turtle, grouper, sharks. They came at you out of nowhere, like in a dream. You couldn't run, and if you screamed, there was no one to hear you. And if the sharp jaws of a giant turtle tore your air hose, the water all around you poured in and finished the job. Well, those were the chances you took when you dived for sponges. That was the job I came to get in Tarpon Springs. I found out something else about this place. Practically all the sponge boat crews, the divers and the skippers, are Greek. I mean, their grandfathers and their great-grandfathers were Greek. Years ago, the biggest sponge beds used to be in the Mediterranean off the coast of Greece. But after a couple of centuries, they got picked pretty clean. Then somebody discovered them growing at the bottom of the Gulf of Mexico. So, we sent for the old Greek fishermen, who knew how to go about diving for them. They moved over here and they got to work. Their sons and their sons' sons have kept on doing it ever since. They hung on to lots of the old ways. They built their own boats and splashed them with color the same as they used to be in the Mediterranean. Only now they had diesels instead of sails and air compressors instead of hand pumps. Say, we saw you scrambling with that turtle down below. Pretty tight squeeze, eh? No, not too bad. <laughs> get on the tiller, Nick. Head her in for Tarpon Springs. We gotta get these sponges in. Yeah, that was Captain Briacus. Men get into every kind of racket, and in every kind of racket, there's one man who does the job better than anybody else. Briarcus kept his boat out until the last minute and came back with the most sponges. But he always came back. I was at dockside when Captain Briarcus's boat, the St. Philip, came in. The sponges were draped in the rigging, which is the way they bring them in. I uh, figured I'd ask Briarcus for a job. Come on, hurry up! Keep it moving! Well, pretty good catch, Cap. Oh, plenty good. 
Best lot of sponges on the whole Gulf. No other boat in Tarpon Springs got him as good as this. We're going to get big prize at auction. You need a good diver? I'm looking for a job. Navy, eh? Yeah. Diver. Unemployed. Very unemployed. Sorry, I'm full up. But go and speak to Mr. Dimitri. Dimitri, huh? Mr. Dimitri. Where do I find him? Over at the sponge exchange. Everyone knows him. Just ask for Mr. Dimitri. Thanks. So I headed for the sponge exchange. It was just across the street. I wondered what this Dimitri, ah, pardon, Mr. Dimitri looked like. It had to be the local big boy. There's one in every town. The exchange was a big, noisy, open-roofed arena filled with sponge boat crews, their families, and a crowd of buyers from all parts of the world, writing out their bids for the seasoned sponge cats in the different boats. Hello, thank you. A uh, nice-looking gal came pushing through the mob, collecting the bids. She uh, flashed me one of those welcome stranger smiles as she headed back to the auctioneer. I decided it wouldn't hurt to ask her where to find Mr. Dimitri. What could I lose? Thank you. Here they are, Uncle Mike. Thank you, Simmy. Lot of Captain Courageous Boat to Socrates, 18 strings of sheep wool, and three strings of yellow deep sea sponge. Highest bid, $18,000. So, to Mr. Delaney of Chicago, Illinois. Pardon me. I'm looking for Mr. Dimitri. Well, here he comes now. Good morning, Mr. Dimitri. How's the auction going? Fine, just fine. This gentleman's waiting to see you. Yes? I'm Ray Douglas. I'm a deep sea diver. I'd like to take a crack at your sponge racket. What's the chances? You've had experience, huh? Well, not on sponges. Well, sponge diving is different. Same water. And maybe the Navy is raw. Oh. Smart fella, huh? Nothing to write home about. Just looking for a job. As a sponge diver? That's what I've been figuring all the way from San Pedro. Well, I'm sorry I can't do anything for you, Douglas. I have all the men I can use. But you just circulate around with the other boys. I'm sure that an experienced diver like you will have no trouble. No trouble at all. Thanks for the free advice. Be seeing you. So, to Charles he thinks he can pick sponges like watermelons off the ground. He looks nice. A lot of Captain Bianca spoke to St. Philip. 27 strings of all sheep wool sponge. Finest quality. Highest bid for Captain Brianco's lot. $27,500. Sold to Mr. Cardenas of Mexico City, Mexico. 27 and a half grand, that's dough. Let's get paid off. Last call for all bids. 27 and a half grand. I didn't figure anybody ever paid that kind of dough for sponges. Well, you live, and if you're where you should be, you learn. I was learning. Dimitri handed Briaka's cash in the spot, less what he took off for his supplies. SpongeBob crews got paid off in shares. The bigger the catch, the more for each share. As soon as the sale was made at auction, the big payoff took place. Deckhands, the lifeline tender, and the cook each got two shares. Divers generally got four. Captain kept six or seven good dough in anybody's language. Only that diver, Alex, he didn't look particularly happy. A character with troubles. Uh, some guys you just can't figure out. Here was a diver who just collected a bunch of money, and he wasn't happy. Troubles. Everybody's got them. What do you want? What was bothering him? I uh, watched him stopping and looking over one of the boats. It reminded me of a kid admiring a horse that he wished he could own, but knew he couldn't. Lot of Captain Atlas, Boat, and Calliope. Nine strings of wire and finger sponges. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a very small price. My highest bid for Captain Atlas' lot is only $400. Does anybody care to raise this bid? Anybody? So, to Mr. Bixler, St. Go check City, that fair, will you, sir? All right. Lot of Captain Poppers of the SpongeBob. Mr. Dimitri. Yeah? Our lot of sponges sold for a few hundred dollars, nothing. Yeah. We've had bad luck the last two trips, haven't you? 
I came in too soon. I was afraid to be late for the auction. I couldn't find the sponge beds at first. I walked the bottom of the sea for miles. You, you know me for a long time, Dimitri. I'm the oldest diver on the Gulf. Everyone knows me to be honest. What are you getting at? I don't got the money. Please, Dimitri, let me have my boat for one more trip. I pay back what I owe you and more. Ah, don't beg. He's not going to let us have it. Can't you see that? When a man is poor, he starves with pride. But when he is old, he has to beg. Maybe we can work out something. I'll tell you what I'll do. You go on running the boat just like you still owned it. I'll supply it. You run it. On shares. We can have it, George. You hear? We can have our boat. How many shares? Oh, oh one share for your father and... I'll give you a share, too. One share? Only one share each? Sure. And I'm being generous. Listen, you're getting too old to dive, and kids like you are a dime a dozen. That's my proposition. He wants everything we've got, Pop. He's taking everything we've got. I'm not taking anything. Listen, I've done all the giving. I supplied your boat. If you can't pay the money you owe me, you got to give up your boat. Please, Dimitri, one share is no good. How can we live? I'm still a good diver like always. Ask Briakos or Johnny or Nick. Yeah. You ask them for a job, too. Come on, Pop. The boat is still mine, Dimitri. I can sell it. Well, go right ahead. But don't forget to pay me the money you owe me. Who will give me work? An old man. They will say, he used to be captain of his own boat. What have I done wrong? Nothing, Pop. Nothing. Come on, Pop. We don't belong here anymore. Let's go. All right. As soon as we finish packing, we'll go. Taking this? What? Think Captain? Well, yes, yes, of course. What good did all your praying do? All the candles you lit for? What's that? What good did your parents to her do? Be careful what you are saying. Did it help us find sponges? Did it keep us from losing our boat? Are you talking like a fool? Who did it? I've heard enough. And Catherine can't help. Dimitri's the one we should have prayed to. Dimitri. Blasphemer! <laughs> Beg St. Catherine to forgive you. I won't. I won't. Pray to St. Catherine now. When you do wrong, you have to be punished. Okay, Pop. Hot beggar. Put me up. How do you suppose I feel when you say things like that? Your mother used to pray for you many, many times when she was alive. It is good to pray. It is good to have faith. Otherwise, we, we are alone. This world has no time for us. How much longer can I be with you? And when I am gone, who are you going to turn to, huh? Please, pray, my boy. Pray. <laughs> Forgive me, St. Catherine. Save us from the evil one. Deliver us from skunks like Dimitri. Oh, that last part, that wasn't necessary. St. Catherine ought to be told about things like that, Pop. Everybody else knows it. Maybe. You forgive my old man for being such a... such a good guy. <laughs> you are all wet. Do you, do you want to catch cold? <laughs> of some of the characters around here. Uh, I mean, some of the sponge divers. Uh, are you a sponge diver? Uh-huh. <laughs> Would you mind if I take your picture? Why? Oh, for some of the big magazines. Huh? Sure, go ahead. Oh, thanks. Uh, excuse me, now. Let's see. Mm. Yeah, it's pretty good. <laughs> uh, 
that's fine. Just like that. That's right. Oh, boy. Oh, now, now, hold it. Uh, here we go now. Boy, is this going to be terrific. Uh, just a minute, uh, uh, maybe move a little to the starboard, uh, or the port, or something. Yes, thanks. Here we go now. That's it. Big smile now. <laughs> Here we go. Now, now hold it. Now hold it. Hold it. Hold it. <laughs> Help! 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 you do a silly thing like that? Yeah, well, I was just <clears throat> taking this picture and all, it, all, all I was doing, I was just, like, I was backing up, you see, just sort of to get a focus. And then I don't know, oh! Pull yourself up. I'm in a hurry. Sometimes it's a park bench or a patch of shady lawn or a little spaghetti joint where Tony always saves the same table. In this case, it was one of those out-of-the-world lagoons, a private paradise. Maybe you had troubles when you got to a place like this, but this is where you left them. Yep, there was a no trespassing sign here. Only love and beauty could come in. is losing the Calliope. I know, I heard. I want to buy it. I'd be a captain. And we'd have our own boat. We can wait. Wait? See me, I don't want to wait. How many years have I been diving? Eight. Nine. And what have I got to show for it? It's the captain that gets the big shares, not the divers. I'm sick of working for somebody else. For a while, I had to do it. Had to learn the business. All right. Now I know it. Nobody has to tell me where the best sponge banks are. And nobody has to tell me how to run a boat. The next time I go out, it will be on my boat. And, um, where are you going to get the money? Oh, why do you have to keep reminding me? Because if I don't, somebody else will. And I love you. I'll get that money. I'll get it from Dimitri. Oh, no, please. Why no? Not Dimitri. Oh, you're just prejudiced because you work for him. I don't want any favors. This is a straight business deal. Alex, I want you to promise me that you'll not speak to Dimitri about money. But there's no reason why. I don't want you to. Afraid it might hurt your job? I didn't mean anything by that. I'm sorry. Then why do you always say things to hurt me? Simi, I love you. 
I'll figure out some way to get that money. Don't worry about it. And if Dimitri... All right. No more, I promise. Come on, let's go. Ote tapasti samo Samyo tisat Ote tapasti samo Your name Johnny? That's right. Uh, some of the boys told me to talk to you. Sure. Uh, I'm looking for a job. <laughs> me too. Yeah? Yeah. The old man who owns this boat is losing it. Well, how about a beer? That's a good idea. Where do we go? Over that way. One guy without a job is a pain in the neck. Two guys without a job and you've got time for a laugh. You still don't know where your next meal's coming from, but you can talk about it. Johnny knew this town, knew the divers, the kind of people that I wanted to know. There's your best sponge diver on the whole gulf. Hey, Alex, see me! to be captain of his own boat. All he needs is the money. Yeah, if you're poor, you need it, and if you're rich, you want it. Well, Captain, when are you sailing? Right after Epiphany. <laughs> he hasn't got a nickel, and he's buying a boat. He hasn't got a boat in his sailing. You're nuts. Sure. He admits it. How can you be in love with a guy like that? Another minute you ask him to go along with him as his first diver on a boat he hasn't got. I was just going to get around to that, you see? And you'll be fool enough to go with him. How can I refuse? He's my best friend. Johnny, you mean you'll go? That's wonderful. Now we're getting somewhere. You're hired. You're nuts. And I'm worse. Hey, he's looking for a job. You want to hire him? Sure. If I get the Calliope, you're on. Well, thanks. Well, Captain, I hate to remind you, but uh, what about the money? You know, nothing happens without the money. I'm going to arrange for it. Where? Right over there. No. Shut up, Jenny. Hey, Dimitri, come over here. I got a deal for you. What do you got on your mind, John? He wants to buy the Calliope. Well, there's nothing serious about that. Only he ain't got the money. Well, why didn't you ask me, Alex? I'd loan you the money. You know this sponge business. That's all the security I need. Well, uh... Do you want it or don't you? Simi, what do you say? He wants it. Drop by the office and pick up a check. Thanks, Dimitri. You see? No strings. So now it was Captain Alex. Now he was playing with the big boys. Of course, there was a kind of a joker in the deal, with Dimitri's face stuck on it. But this wasn't the time for worry. Alex had his boat. It wasn't the way Simi wanted it, but how could you be sore at a guy who was so happy? He made Simi come aboard the Calliope. The Calliope, that's Greek for the goddess of poetry. And it was music and poetry that was in the hearts of both these kids at this moment. Beautiful. Do you know how much I love you? How much? More than, more than all the boats in the world. Show me the rest of the book. All right, come on. Hello, Arthur. Hello. Welcome, my friends. I was expecting you, Alex. They told me you were going to buy the book. I'm sorry it has to happen this way, Arthur. It's all right. I'm glad it's you. There you are. Yeah. Now the board is yours, and this goes back to Dimitri. What's he needed for? Hasn't he got enough? What goods are going to do him? Be quiet. Honest men pay their debts. What's honest about Dimitri? George, you, you showed him the boat, huh? Hello. Uh, 
Uh, say, I want to get some pictures of uh, sponge divers in action on a boat out at sea. <laughs> you think there'd be a chance of me going along with you, Captain? <laughs> <Huh>? <laughs> I wouldn't be any trouble. I'd keep out of everybody's way. <laughs> huh? <laughs> oh, now, look, Captain, look. i got to get some pictures of these sponge divers. <laughs> now, please, what do you say? <laughs> no! Oh, I hate to leave this boat. It's like losing an old friend. Atos, George, where are you going? Come back here! We should have wished you good luck. I need some advice. Maybe you can help me. Well, sure, Alex, of course. How many men do I need for a crew? Oh, six or seven. That's what I thought. I've signed on. Johnny and a Navy diver, a new man. I need a couple more divers and some deckhands. I could show you the good diver with lots of experience. I wouldn't care how old he was. And the deckhand could be young, even a boy. I wouldn't mind. Please, don't say that, Alex. I'm an old man. No one on the whole golf would let me dive again. Well, you want to come with me? Do we? Pop, did you hear what he said? <laughs> All right, we're sailing the morning after Epiphany. Be here early. I guess St. Catherine must have been listening, huh? Yes, yeah, she must have been listening. <laughs> Epiphany is celebrated in its own way down here. It's big and sacred. And the whole town is part of it. Well, that makes sense. The whole town is dependent on the sea for its living and the lives of its men. This is the day when the waters are blessed. It's a fisherman's holiday, a day for the men who go down to the sea and hope to get back. They say here that the one who dives and brings the cross back is the lucky one for the year, the hero. They treat him like a hero, too. Everybody piles him up with gifts, and the luck goes with it. Alex needed all the luck he could get. A new captain on his first trip out. I could have used some myself, but I just watched. The cross cut a golden arc through the air and sank. The divers were right on it. From the top, you couldn't tell who had it. And even underneath, only one of the guys would know. They were breaking for the surface. I got it! They had faith down here. They believed. They didn't work alone. It was big, too big for any one of them alone. And this was the time when they showed they were all together. The swimmers came out of the water. The archbishop knew them all and prayed for them all, the winner and the losers. To every man who went down to the sea in ships, the sea was a friend or an enemy. Every man hoped it would be his friend. By tomorrow, most of them would be out in the Gulf. For most of them, this was their last day in shore. Some of them might never see it again. Win or lose, that's the way it has to be. It's all written down somewhere in a big book and you can't fight it. And well, they could be right. Who knows? Calliope was set to sail the next morning. Alex must have been on board all night loading supplies. Johnny arrived first. It wasn't just talk anymore about Alex being a captain of his own boat. It was real. It was happening. Yep, Captain Alex was in business. I got there right after Johnny and stowed my gear aboard. Oh, gosh, it felt good having a job again. Then old Atlas and his son came on. The old man was 50 if he was a day. It's the prime of life, but not exactly the time for strolling on wet sand with a thousand pounds of lead on your back. But he still looked game. Then another character turned up named Nick. Maybe he was none of my business, but I didn't like his face. Alex said he worked with him on Captain Briarcus's boat last trip. Good diver. 
<laughs> Talking of characters. Hi. Yes? Say, uh, how about uh, going along with you on the cruise? What, do you want to take pictures again? Oh, I'll do anything. No, huh? Wait a second. I could use a ship's cook. Can you cook? Uh, can I cook? Oh, can I cook? <laughs> I can cook better than... Uh, better than... Uh, than I can take pictures. <laughs> can I cook? <laughs> Fine. I'll tell you what. I'll sign you on as a cook. How's that? Oh, that's wonderful. Look, now I'll go home and get my stuff, see? And, uh... Don't go away till I get back. I'll be right here. I'll be right back. Okay. Don't go away. What a character. Well, good morning, Simmy. You act like you're in a hurry. I was just going to see someone. I'll be right back. See someone? Oh, yes, I remember. The Calliope's leaving this morning. I'll be just a little while. Oh, what's your hurry? You know how it is when a sponge boat's leaving. Always a delay at the last moment. But I think I'd better be going. Oh, you act nervous. Oh, I'm not nervous. Go on. I wouldn't want you to miss it. Dimitri was playing his own game. Giving with one hand and taking with the other. There was time with go, with power, but he wanted more. He wanted what he couldn't get. Simi. Alex watched her running along the wharf, but she was too late. There's a time for a ship to sail, and a time for a woman to say goodbye. But there wasn't any time to wait. There wasn't any time.
the captain had to rule them all. It took more than navigation to run a ship, and a sponge boat was no different from any of them. We reached another spot that looked promising. Alex yelled for Atlas to heave the lead again. Fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, rock bottom, sixteen fathom. You're over the best now. Everything's ready. Who dives first, Alex? Hey, Alex. Let me get down first. I want to go first. I want to go first. Stop the argument, fellas. Stop the argument. Let me go. All right, well, let's split for it, huh? What do you say? Head to tail. Take his. But you vote to lose. The captain dives first. Me get me ready. Come on, Johnny. Everybody sprang to life. We got the Kloopers and started lowering over the stern. Kloopers are wire guards that uh, fit around the Calliope's propellers like uh, big bird cages. They have to be put on whenever a diver is down to prevent the air hose from sneaking against the propeller's spinning blades and getting cut. Alex was getting into a suit. He checked over the gear. Lifeline, air hose, air pump, motor. We were all set. Gangway! Gangway! <laughs> hey, please take that away. Oh, no, this is for Alex before he sinks. <laughs> Hey, here, Alex. Look, you got beans and sauerkraut, weenies and hot spaghetti and hot soup. Oh, boy. Here. Nobody eats before they die. Makes them sick. No. Now, get out of here. No, no. Here. Get out. Oh. Now, get out! <laughs> Diving suits weren't tailored for lines. With a helmet on, the only part of the body in contact with the water are the hands. Rubber cuffs hug the wrists to keep the water from leaking in. You get fitted with a pair of shoes, soled and heeled, with lead. The suit weighs about 200 pounds and about as comfortable as a suit of armor on a hot afternoon. Sometimes you stand on a platform and get lowered down. Sometimes you climb down a ladder. In a sponge boat, you jump. They had a saying down here, a diver for two years was a diver for life. The job is to make sure you live for those two years with something left over for the rest of your life. It was as beautiful as a fairyland. It could also be as dead as a grave. But the fascination of deep sea diving, once it got you, it stuck forever. And man's a strange animal. Walking the earth ain't enough. He's got to beat the birds flying and take over the ocean from top to bottom. You moved in a world of your own under the sea, a world where nothing ever made a sound. It was more than just silence. It was a heavy, walled-in stillness, like the silence of deafness. A hundred feet over your head, the sun was shining. Your pals were breathing fresh air, watching the air hose, the helm, and the numbers in the air pump dial to see that you got what you needed to keep alive. But below, you move in shadows that have been there since the world began. In those shadows, things were living and growing and fighting. A world of beauty, and danger. Weirdly shaped plants, monster fish, slow-witted without expression. The man-eater shark, the grouper, the octopus, the vicious moray eel with teeth like barbed wire, the deadly manta ray, gliding like an underwater vulture, with a tail like a scorpion. And your only weapon was a four-pronged sponge hook and a sharp knife and the brains of a man. Alex was groping along the bottom while we waited above. Suddenly, Alex saw a shark moving toward him. A thousand pounds of bone, muscle, teeth that could rip you to shreds, coming at you like murder in the dark. Alex was grappling to reach the soft underbelly with his knife. swam off to let its wounds heal or to die in the shadows. We hauled Alex aboard. We were all a pretty unhappy crew, and it looked like we were going to stay that way for quite a while. Well, like I said, you had to learn to take the good with the bad. You didn't have to like it, but you took it. Pete was a little unhappy too, but not about the same thing. Looks like he didn't like his own cooking. Hey, Pete! I'm as hungry as a wolf. Bring me a bowl of hot soup and some bacon and... Uh... Hey, Pete, what's the matter? 
Fitek? I'll get you something to eat, Alex. What's the matter? It's not the right place. Let's keep moving. We're wasting time. We missed the auction. We're stuck with the sponges until the next one. With no cash to buy supplies for the next trip. All right, we can't help that. Let's go. Where now? Straight out. Okay. It's your boat. I'll take over. All right. Don't be impatient, Alex. Sometimes in a place that don't look so good at first, you, you got to keep on looking. If you want, I go down here and look some more. No, we'll go on. So we kept going. We hit out on a new tack. We moved from one place to another. And the days kept slipping away. We were aching to work, and there was nothing to do but keep moving around, looking, waiting, hoping, hoping the next spot would be the right spot. But the clock kept ticking off the minutes, and the hours, and the days. The days, and then the weeks. And still, nothing. It didn't cheer us up to sight some of the other boats already sailing for home with full loads of sponges draped in their rigging and packed in their holes. The Socrates and the St. Philip must have full loads already. There was Captain Briarchus, Alex's old skipper, heading back in plenty of time for the auction. Yeah, some guys had all the luck. But it couldn't all be luck. No, Briarchus knew his business. He worked his divers hard, but he knew where the hard work paid off best. That's why he was the best sponge boat skipper on the Gulf. Everybody in Tarpon Springs knew it. And, uh, yeah, he knew it better than anybody. A little rooster of a guy. to leave salt sponges in the gulf for the other boat. Can't take everyone, eh? That's wonderful. Did you see the Calliope? Oh, we passed it yesterday. Is everything all right? Is it coming in? It was going the other way. The other way? Yeah, the other way. Come on, fellows. Hurry up. Take those sponges off. Captain Briacos and another boat just came in. Full loads already? They passed the Calliope. It was going the other way. Is Alex in trouble? He might be. If he doesn't find the bank, he'll come back with nothing. Well, then he'll lose his boat. Stop worrying, silly. This isn't the first time he's been out on a sponge boat. He can take care of himself. Now, here's a kid that's a good diver. A fine diver. So he isn't satisfied. He wants to be a captain. Yeah, Joe. Briacus wants to store the sponges in the clovers, Mike. You got the keys? Yeah, come on. Am I glad I only auction sponges and don't sell them? And do I worry? Make money for everybody except for me. Why do you keep telling yourself that he's going to have hard luck? He's a smart boy. He'll be all right. It might happen. Don't take the boat away from him, please. Well, he's not going to lose his boat. No matter what happens, you have nothing to worry about. You wait till he gets back. You're letting this get you. Maybe you're right. Sure. Now relax. When he comes back, we'll talk about it if you want. And finally, we hit it. Right on the nose. A beautiful spot. It was only a few days before the auction. But we still had time to make it if everybody worked to the limit. Yep, it was a beautiful spot. It was like picking flowers in a meadow with a strong wind blowing against you and the rainbow fish floating by you like birds. Everybody worked, top sign and below. There's nothing in the world like work. Sure, you hear plenty of guys talking about spending the rest of their lives doing nothing. Well, they can have it. Ah, you never saw a happier crew than we were now. They kept sending down the empty sacks, and we kept sending them up. Filled. The sponges were all over the place, just waiting for us. Thousands of dollars worth of sunken treasure. Enough to buy out Dimitri. Enough for Alex, for Simi, for old Atlas and George. More than enough for all of us. We worked from sunrise to sunset as 
as long as we could see, trying to beat out the clock that wouldn't stop moving against us. Our luck had changed. This is the way we wanted it. All the coral grit was taken out of them. We worked and rested and worked. Everybody had his job. Who's down? Johnny, the two hours. Bring him up. Okay. Who's then is it next? Athos. He's asleep. I'll go get him, huh? No, wait a minute. He looks tall in. I'll dive next. Johnny hit the surface and floated himself into the ladder hanging over the side of the Calliope. There's a way of letting your suit get inflated with air so that you're encased in a kind of raft. But you have to know how to do it. Inflate it too much and you'll bob around like a paper bag. Johnny knew the trick. There was a good sailor and a good shipmate. A great combination when you can find it. Yep, Alex was lucky in this and so was Johnny. They'd be working together until they were both as old as old Atlas. And they'd still be good shipmates. There, Johnny. Thanks, Pete. Yeah. Hey, Johnny, how was it down there, huh? How was it? Why don't you try it? Yeah. Oh, boy, if I only could. What a diver I'd make. Oh, I'd pick sponges by the bunches. I'd move around and I'd run around fast enough. I saw a shark, I'd cut his heart out and throw it in his face. <laughs> oh, boy, if I saw one of those octopuses. Oh, boy. <laughs> okay, Pete, you do. Yeah? Put the suit on. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, I take care of those slimy monsters. <laughs> Where did they get off protecting a guy like me who just came down to pick up a couple of those little sponges? It, huh? Put the suit on. You're going down next. Uh, well, wait a minute, Alex. I was only kidding. <laughs> I wasn't. Uh, you weren't? No. Well, yeah, I'll see you later. Well, now, uh, now, now, wait a minute, fellas. Wait a minute now. Hey, fellas, I've changed my mind. Oh, you have when a diving helmet is bolted on, it's like a prison cell with you inside. There are windows in front, on the sides, and on top for you to see what's happening. <laughs> Pete didn't care for it. He didn't care for the whole idea. What happened with Pete started out to be a joke. <laughs> Everybody liked Pete. Getting a saltwater suit on him and dropping him in the drink wouldn't do him any harm, and he meant a few minutes break for us. And maybe he'd be lucky to meet a mermaid. Guys like him often do. Okay, I'm gonna move. Well, we got gotcha, you now. I, 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 but we're out of the photographer. You can't all take it, get them ready. Bring up on those octopuses. <laughs> 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 Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come once he got over the scare of being locked up in a suit, Pete was going to get a kick out of diving. Nick got the pressure up. Pete was still squawking when we finally pushed him over. Jumping into deep water is like a parachute jump in slow motion. Slow, very slow. But you never know what's slowly going to happen to you next. Pete will be all right? Sure, he'll be all right. Well, we'll give him ten minutes. Give him something to write home about. Right. When Pete reached the bottom, he tried getting up in his pins. It was more of a job than he figured on, what with the air hose and the lifeline crossing him up. But he kept trying. He began to like it. The fascination of being underwater began to get him. Then, he spotted a sponge. It wasn't a prized specimen, but it was the best he could do, and he headed for it bumping along in the bottom. And finally he reached it and hooked it up. <laughs> he grinned as he looked at it. A sponge worth a million bucks to him and a half a buck to anybody else. But it was all his. Then he kept going looking to find more. We could make him out from the deck of the Calliope crawling along like a crab. Suddenly, the air pressure took a nosedive. Inside his helmet, Pete started choking and yelling. Alex! The bubbles are stopping! What are you trying to do, Ken? Uh, 
Alex and Johnny got Pete back on the surface again. Hey, Douglas! Help Pete! The joke that looked for a minute like a tragedy was over. We could give thanks for that. But what made the air pressure drop? How did that happen? I'm uh, sorry, Pete. Pete, something happened to the pump. How do you uh, feel, boy? You all right, huh? Look, come on, you all right? What happened? Huh? Wait a minute, wait a minute. Where, where's my sponge? <laughs> where's my sponge? Huh? Where's my sponge? 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 Oh, hello, sponge. <laughs> ah. You're all right, huh, fella? <laughs> I suppose you guys haven't any idea how this happened. Not me. I didn't move from this spot. Oh, except for two or three minutes to get some oil. He was here the whole time. What are you trying? I don't want any piping in my boat. Nick, go and clean the diving helmet. Well, who did it? Not usually the way I commit murder. Okay, I didn't think it was you anyway. As soon as we get the pressure up again, you'll die. Go and get ready. Yeah. Oh, well, we ought to make the auction now, huh, Nick? Yeah. Oh, boy, what a nice collection of bathroom furniture. Look at it. Oh, by the way, will you hold my sponge while I make a picture of it? That's the one I caught. Yeah. Okay, thanks. One sponge Pete. Yeah, it was nearly one sponge without Pete. Then they got me ready for a dive. No, I wasn't singing with joy, not so you'd know it. Things were moving fast, but not exactly in the right direction. I had my own suspicions as to who was steering them wrong. But you couldn't be absolutely sure. You couldn't take a chance in being wrong. And it made you feel jittery to know that somebody on board couldn't be trusted while you were under a hundred feet of water. You were being sniped at when you couldn't fight back. Somebody was kicking you when you were down. Diving was different from most other jobs. It wasn't only because you were underwater where no human being belonged in the first place, but because once you were under, you were completely dependent on other people to take care of you. Let them forget about you for just three minutes and you were on your way to a better world. There was something to worry about. I kept picking this stuff and sending up full net sacks. We still had three days left, but everything had to go smooth. There couldn't be any more phony accidents. And that made me think of Nick. And wonder what he had up his sleeve, and what was biting him, or who was paying him off. And that made me think of Dimitri. Yep, I could see the whole setup. But I was really thinking of Alex. Was he keeping his eyes wide open? Well, that wasn't so easy. He couldn't see everything that was happening. I mean, he still didn't think anybody would cut the clovers loose and make it possible for the air hose to snake up against the blades of the propeller. So I kept working, and what I didn't know didn't bother me, then. It wasn't until I began getting near the end of my trick and feeling like I should stay down for another couple of hours and let old Athos really get a rest, that I got that peculiar hunch that makes you think something is starting to go wrong. It was just a hunch, nothing definite. I checked the air valve, the lifeline, the air hose. Everything okay. Douglas is doing all right. Five sacks already. He's good. Try to get along with him, will you? I get along with everybody. The air valve inside the helmet stopped his... Or maybe I just thought so. Okay, so I was getting jittery. The whole world is full of fresh air, all free. I just wanted to be sure that I kept on getting my share of it. Anything wrong with that? I signaled the deck to haul me up. Up to sunshine and voices. Up to where you could fight and see who you were fighting. Nice work, Douglas. Hey, you're good. Leave it to the Navy. Nick! Hey, hey, Nick! Hey, something happened to that pump again. No, everything went fine. It's been my imagination. Okay, Nick, get you somewhere to go down. Go down? That's it, get him ready. It's not my turn, it's the old man's. <laughs> 
I don't want any change in turns on this trip. It's bad luck. All that is goes after you. Come on, come on. You're wasting time. It don't make no difference. I go if you want to, Alex. He's going. It's all yours. Oh, no, I don't go. I said you're going. No. Now get into that suit. No, I can't. Get into that suit. No, no, I won't. <laughs> okay, Atos, it's your dive. Here you are, Pat. Good luck. Thank I'm going you. up top. This is the part of the yard I wish I could skip. I can't. It happened. The old man got ready to dive. This was old stuff to him after all these years. The kid wanted to be a diver himself one day. He liked watching how the old man worked. Or it could be he was just a little worried and wanted to be where he could see down to the bottom, just in case. But the old man wasn't worried. Or if he was, he didn't let anybody know. By all the rules, he should have been back in Tarvin Springs, sitting with the rest of the old-timers in a coffee house, smoking a pipe and spinning out the stories about the great old days. Somebody once said that the tragedy of old age is that you don't feel old. Athos was that kind of a tragedy. Yeah, this is the way he wanted it. And this is the way it was. Only, he didn't know the whole story. Only one guy on board knew that. One guy's secret. Old Athos must have felt fine knowing he was still able to work with the younger divers knowing that he could still keep going for himself and his kid. He pushed along the bottom, doing his job like the expert that he was. While over his head, we were all doing our jobs. Johnny at the lifeline, me at the tiller, with my eye on the air pump dial to make sure it didn't do any more tricks. Everything was going smooth. I mean, uh, seemed to be going smooth. Until a section of air hose trailing behind the old man's helmet fouled in some rocks. He felt the drag and stopped. It didn't look too serious. The air hose wasn't damaged, just caught. But he couldn't see what was winding up high over his head. He made for the rocks and started to work the air hose free. Somehow that was turning out to be a tougher job than he expected. And then it happened. The next second he was gasping. The air was leaking out of the hose and it wasn't because of the rocks. The air hose was cut. Maybe as young George died, he was remembering how his father once pushed him in the water to make him pray. But now it was his father who was praying, praying for help. The old man was still struggling to install the air hose from the rocks so he could be hauled up, but he was losing strength. Then the kid reached the bottom and began making his way to his father. He only had how much, say, three minutes underwater to reach his father, free the hose and get back to the surface himself. Three minutes to give for his father's life. The old man saw his son coming nearer. And then his joy turned to horror because he saw something the kid couldn't see. He shouted in warning, but the shouts died inside his helmet. The kid kept swimming straight for it. And the next second, it was too late. Something snapped shut on the kid's leg like the jaws of a steel trap and held him fast. The scientific boys called this thing Tridacna. In the Pacific, we used to find them dug in the sand just offshore when the tide rolled out. They're clams, the almightiest of all clams, four feet across and weighing 500 pounds. A clam that you can't pry open once it closes on you. Old Atlas saw his son, saw him dying before his eyes, and he struggled to reach him, to help him. He fought with all the desperation, with all the fury and all the strength that he had left to give for the life of his son. And he was fighting this last terrible battle alone. Then, Alex died. At a hundred feet, Water feels like a load of bricks. It lumps down on you, it presses you on all sides. It hammers at your head and makes your heart pump like an engine that's going to explode. You try to move and you know you're carrying the ocean on your back. But Alex reached the air hose where it was still fouled around the rocks and yanked it free. Then Johnny hauled the old man up. We never thought we'd see him again. And even so, we didn't know until we got his helmet off whether we'd find him dead or alive. Alex kept going, fighting his way through the water. The kid was reaching up, reaching for us, reaching for life. And finally, Alex got to him and brought him up. We got him aboard. Alex, I got something to tell you. You gotta listen to me. Oh, 
Shut up! Are you, you all right, huh? You feel better? Yeah. Huh? Where's George? Where's my boy? He's right over there. Oh, you got him. I saw him in front of me. He was trying to get the lifeline loose, and then he got caught, but you got him. Yeah, but not soon enough. What do you mean? But he... He's dead. My boy is dead. My boy is dead. He died in front of my eyes. He died trying to help me. He needed me, and I, and I couldn't go to him. You did everything you could. But why couldn't it be me? What good am I anymore? He's so young. I gave him his life, and he gave it back to me. But what good is it? George didn't just die. Somebody helped kill him. Helped kill him? What are you saying, dog? The propeller guards were off. Who could do such a thing? Who? Me. Me, I did it. I killed him. Nobody but me. <gasps> Why did you do it? I didn't mean to kill him. I was only trying to spoil your trip. Who'd you do it for? Who's paying you off? Dimitri. Dimitri? He wants the boat. He promised it to Briakos. He wants your girl. Why, you... <laughs> it's the truth. After what's happened, I don't need to lie. All right, we're going back. No, no, Alex, not yet. We'll take your boy home, Atlas. What's done is done. Other boats will be passing, and I can take George home. You stay here. Don't lose the boat. Don't let Dimitri take it. Stay here and work. Work while you still have time. Later that day, we sighted the Athanasia, homeward bound, and hailed her in. We told her the news. We told her we wanted her to take old Athos and his son back to Tarpon Springs while we stayed on and worked. Yep, it was all written down somewhere. Good or bad, that's how it had to be. But you never knew, and you couldn't fight it. And it still happened. You had to learn how to take it. You had to keep on working, keep on living. Death came, but life went on. It wasn't the same, but it went on. Then old Athos put his kid aboard. The kid who is older than any of us now. The kid who is taking his last trip home. Tennessee sailed up the bayou into Tarpon Springs the next day with a full load of sponges and a kid who'd never be a diver and an old man. The news of what happened went before it as if death was his own messenger perched on the prow of a ship of doom. The whole town seemed to sense that death had come in and they started gathering from everywhere. Athos got his son ashore. And then he stood. Not the meek little guy anymore, but a guy with the face of an avenging angel. Murderer. Murderer! Are you out of your mind? Athos, what happened? You killed my boy. You killed him. You... Stop that! I don't know what you're talking about. My boy is dead. Do you understand? You killed him. You and Nick. That's a lie. No, it's no lie. It happened. You didn't want Alex to come in. 
You got Nick to do everything, to try to kill me, to kill Alex. Alex? Yes, Alex. He tried to kill Alex. And you are friends with this man, this murderer. Why did you kill my boy? Why did you? He didn't know anything to you. He's over there now lying dead, drowned. How do I know what happens a hundred miles from here? Am I responsible for every accident that happens on a sponge accident? boat? Accident? When the propeller guards are caught, you call that an accident? I don't know, but it's got nothing to do with me. When the compass is broke, is that an accident? When the air pump is stopped when the man is diving, is that an accident? Tell me. Tell you what? That I don't know what you're talking about. Listen, I'm sorry for what happened to your boy, but I didn't kill him. What do you expect when you go out with a kid like Alex for a skipper? He knows how to dive, sure. But what does he know about running a boat? He wanted to be a captain. So I gave him the money to buy a boat. Does that make me responsible for everything that happened? It's a wonder that any of you got back alive. Don't blame me. If anyone kills your boy, it's Alex. Dimitri! Shut up! Please see me. Forgive an old man for being angry, but I know how it feels to lose something you love. I was afraid Alice was going to lose you, but I was wrong. Listen, we're all in this now. That stupid neck has botched up everything. What? I want you to get out there and bust up that calio. I said get out there and bust up the calio.
answer me. Alex is on his way in. You wait outside and watch for the Calliope and let me know just a minute it docks. I gotta slow up the auction. Oh, yeah, answer me. Yes? Now, let me see if it was something else. Oh, gee, you know it anyways. Well, what, for goodness sakes? Well, he... he loves you. Oh, Pete! <laughs> hurry, hurry, last call. Everybody ready? Last call for all bids. Are all the bids in? Hold it, Mike. Alex will be here in a minute. You've got to hold the bidding till he gets here. That's impossible. All the bids are in. I can't oh, delay any longer. Yeah, but... I'm sorry for Alex. You see, as long as I've got the bids, I've got to start. Yeah. See? Uh, I, I say as long as the bids are in my hand. Yeah, I I've know. got. I say as long as I'm holding the bids. Uh, I can't go. If the bids were not in my hand, I wouldn't have to. Here, give me back those bids. I can't do anything without those bids. Uh, no, I can't do. No, don't try to shove me off of here. Uh -huh. Say a speech. Uh -huh. I say don't push me. Oh, I. Oh. <laughs> Oh, speech. Oh, well, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I, I guess you're all here to uh, buy sponges. Uh, uh, but do any of you know uh, the life history of a sponge? Huh? <laughs> oh, then I'll tell you. <clears throat> Is a sponge uh, animal, uh, vegetable, or mineral? Is it a he or a she? Uh, does it have fun being a sponge? <laughs> huh? Oh. <clears throat> Uh, if those are the important questions people are asking about sponges. So, if you'll all be comfortable, I'll tell you. <laughs> oh, well, there are a lot of types of sponges. The big ones and the little ones. Get this auction going. Now, I can't. Oh, some people like well, what's he doing with them? Sponges. Oh, here you can have them. <laughs> pick them up. Help me pick them up. <laughs> me to close this auction before we offered you our finest lot of sponges. Uh, another lot just came in. Captain Alex of the Kaopi. All first grade sheep wool sponges from 16 fathoms. 32 strings of finest quality. Get your bids in, please. Last call for all bids. Write out your bids. Last call. Get your bids in. Get your bids in. Hurry, hurry. All bids in, please. This is the last lot. This will end the auction. Get your bids in to me, please. Let me have your bid. Okay, Mike. Here goes Dimitri. Come on, let's go. Don't go away, folks. There's lots of time. Let me have your highest bids and make them high. There's no wall as terrifying as a wall of angry men. The bravest guy would rather turn and run. And Mr. Dimitri wasn't the bravest guy. Maybe it was old Athos who aroused them, but I think it was the kid. The voice out of the water, crying out against Dimitri's cry. Crying so loud that the whole town heard him and rose. Listen, you guys. Give me a break. I didn't kill your boy. Nick did. Tell him, Athos. Tell him, Athos, that I didn't kill your boy. Tell him I didn't kill your boy. The blood of my boy is on your hands. Give yourself up. What do you want from me? I'll give you anything. My money, my boat, anything. You guys give me a break. <laughs>
justice is done, my boy. The justice won't bring you back. Well, that's the story. Blue water, and the sky, and people. A little world. Or maybe a big one. Yeah, maybe like the whole big world. All love, tears, work, and laughter. <laughs>